I feel like I'm on assignment this morning. I, I, I told, told my brother Randon, I said, I'm going to say what God gave me to say, and I'm going to sit down. Is that all right? Is that okay, promised land? I, I told my mother here before she preached, I said, you know, this is one of the easiest places in the world to preach just because you understand how to respond to the preached word of God. And so I am grateful for that opportunity. And before I dive into my text, I want to say I'm grateful for my wife. I know that sounds like a preacher thing to do, you know, but I, I find myself understanding. <laughs> Many of you do not know, <sighs> do not know the miracle that it is for me to stand here today. And if it wasn't for the picture of grace that our Heavenly Father allowed me to see and view through the lens of my wife and her life, I can honestly say I would not be standing here today. So I thank you for that. I'm going to a familiar passage of scripture if you have your Bibles. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14. I have about 10 verses to read, but I want to set up the story for what I am going to talk about this morning. Let me know when you are there. Matthew 14. Verse number 22. Amen. The Bible says immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, one word, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. I want to grab the end of the story, and I'm going to use a little bit of my imagination, if that's okay. Because I imagined as Peter and Jesus come back to the boat... And in the picture of my mind, I imagine Peter climbing over the sides of the boat. And he's probably dripping wet with water from him falling. The literal evidence of his failure dripping up off of him. Kind of crawling awkwardly onto the boat. And the rest of the disciples in awe looking at what just took place, not just with Jesus, but with, with one of them. And I can just imagine in my mind them, maybe it was John, maybe it was Tom, I don't know. 
just kind of looking at Peter and being like, how did you do that? What was it like? like? We've never seen anybody do that. How did you do that? And this is where I would like to take my title from as Peter, in my mind, responds back, saying four words. Same water, different faith. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, same water, different faith. There's levels to this. Because some of you, under the sound of my voice, have been experiencing your own water that you've been in. And other people may find themselves drowning in what you are walking on. The difference is not the water. The water is not different. The circumstances are not different between you and me. We both experienced a pandemic. But some of us experienced a pandemic a little bit different. Same water, different faith. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the revelation of your name. I thank you for the opportunity to speak before your people. I pray that you anoint my lips right now, Lord God, and that you get the glory from this entire experience. Let us leave here transformed and changed. And we will be careful to give you the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. At the start of the text, it says Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the boat. I had to look up that word. I didn't quite know what that meant. But it said Jesus says, this is not optional. I need you to get inside the boat right now. They were underneath the level of authority, so they didn't really talk back. They just did it. Now, mind you, this story is coming right after Jesus performing the miracle of feeding 5,000. And if we remember, even before Jesus fed the 5,000, he had just received word that his cousin had died. He had been beheaded. And so Jesus, in his natural human state, is experiencing a level of grief, like we all would, right? When a family member is taken from us, especially in a tragic way. Jesus found himself going off alone, but then the crowds, they were following him. And so Jesus, in his compassion, says, okay. Let me just not only feed you with the spiritual things, I'm going to take care of your natural needs. That's really a lesson all by itself because if we're going to be, you know, strong evangelists, maybe we need to start meeting some natural needs of people before we start trying to talk about the spiritual needs. Because once you meet some natural needs, the spiritual needs kind of bring up themselves in the process. So Jesus is now feeding 5,000. He is now got his disciples who were there. Notice in the text, the disciples were the one to go out, get the crowd together, organize them, sit them down. The disciples were the one to bring the loaves and the fishes, right? Then when it was all said and done, the disciples were the one capturing the leftovers. Because when Jesus does something, there is always an abundance to what he does. But he doesn't just waste what he does. He says, I want you to gather the leftovers, okay? The Bible says there were 12 baskets full. I'm doing the math. I got 12 disciples, 12 baskets full. So the disciples, they were on assignment. Every last one of them had a whole entire basket full of evidence of exactly who Jesus was. Y'all following me? And so we have the disciples here. Now, I can imagine... I've just been a fisherman all my life. I've been a tax collector. I've done these regular things. But now I'm with Jesus, and I'm experiencing some things I've never experienced before. And so I can find myself almost at a a point where I'm ready to just, what's next, Jesus? We know that you are going to be the king of all kings. We're ready for your kingdom to come right now. We're tired of the Romans. They've been persecuting us. We're ready to establish your kingdom right now. In fact, one of his disciples was a zealot. So his entire life was spent preparing for the overthrow of the Roman government, okay? But the Bible says Jesus constrain them and says, stop, get in the boat. 
Now, you may ask yourself, why was Jesus so adamant about them getting into the boat? Well, in the Gospel of John, it tells us a little more detail. The people were so excited about the miracle, they were trying to make Jesus king. And Jesus says, no one's going to make me king before my time is up. Now, I can imagine the disciples were probably among the number of people trying to make him king there too. So he says, you are at a sensitive point in your spiritual development. I'm not going to allow you to follow the crowd. I'm going to protect you. And when I protect you, it may not seem like protection, but it's going to be a different direction. How many of you know that direction is really protection? And so he says, I'm going to direct you somewhere else, get inside the boat. Now, that can be frustrating because, Jesus, you just called me out of the boat. You says, I'm going to be fishers of men. So I'm trying to fish for some men. But now you're telling me, get back in the boat. Now, I'm not the rest of the disciples, but I probably would have had some questions. Like, it's late at night, Jesus. Why are we getting in the boat at night, Jesus? Going to the other side. Are you coming with us on the boat ride, Jesus? Last time you was on the boat, there was a big storm that came, and we were all freaking out, Jesus. So now you tell us to get on the boat by ourselves. At now, I'm not scared, Jesus, but mm, I got some questions. I'm not quite ride or die. I got some questions, right? Jesus says, get in the boat. They get in the boat. Now imagine they are experienced fishermen. This boat was not something that they had not experienced before. The lake was something they have experienced before. So some of y'all say, same boat, same, boat. Same, lake, same lake, same water, same water. but different faith. different faith. Say it again, same boat, same, boat. same, lake. same lake, same water, a different faith. It takes a level of faith for you to go back and do what you were doing before when it doesn't quite make sense, when you don't know the right or to the left or why I'm doing what you're asking me to do. But I've been just getting the boat. The Bible says in Mark, it gives a little bit more detail, that Jesus says, I'm going to go up into the mountain to pray probably to finish what he started to do before he had to feed the 5,000, okay? So Jesus is going up into the mountain to pray. The Bible says in Mark that he saw them struggling on the sea in the middle of the water at the fourth hour, the fourth watch. So this is about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm rowing, and it's hard out here, and I'm tired. And I just fed all these people, Jesus, and now you got us out here in the ship crossing the lake for a why. Why? But the Bible says that Jesus saw them, was watching over them the entire time. He finds himself now walking on the water in the middle of the night. The disciples, they see him, they cry out in fear saying, it's a ghost. And the Bible says that he would have passed him by, but he stopped. And now Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me out on the water. And Jesus says, come. So now we got Peter, the only one, the Bible says, that had the strength and the boldness, the presence of mind to step out of the boat and do what he has seen Jesus do. Now, it's really incredible the disciples had just seen Jesus multiply the loaves and the fishes. So they knew he was capable. But only one had the presence and the faith to step out and say, I want to do more of what you have us to be doing. There has to be a reason why we are in this ship, in this boat. So he gets out on the water, and the Bible says he started to walk. But now... He notices the wind and the waves. Now, you can't see wind. Has anybody seen wind here? I haven't seen wind. But I've seen the effect of wind. So what Peter saw was the effect of what he would determine was danger. But there's two things when it comes to fear why we should not be afraid. Because when it comes to fear, usually it's either exaggerated danger 
It's things that we are thinking are greater than what they really are. Or the danger is real, but the solution is greater. So if you are in a situation where you find yourself afraid, there's two reasons why you should not fear. Because the exaggeration of the danger is bigger, or you need to remember the solution is greater. Verse number 28, Jesus says, <laughs> well, Peter says, if it's you, Jesus, bid me come. Now, I want to kind of back up for a second because we, we applaud Peter for having the presence of mind and the faith to step outside the boat. But I believe it was his faith rather than his flex to step outside the boat. Because if it was me, I might have been like, I want to do what you do, Jesus. And so look at me, watch me go. And sometimes we operate from a level of flex as instead of a level of faith. We want to do the things that Jesus does, but really what's our, what's our heart posture? What's our heart posture? Am I here only to flex on the next person? Or am I here to truly operate from a different dimension of faith? Peter sees the wind. Sometimes, again, we don't see the actual danger. We just understand there is an effect behind that. I think our mothers can definitely attest to that. Y'all sometimes don't necessarily see the danger, but you feel something's wrong. You feel, mommies, how many, how many of y'all know mamas out there? I know my mama has come to me. She says, I, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Anybody out there had a mama like that? Who would read your mail and she didn't have all the details, but it didn't matter because she was so locked in with God. She says, I, I don't see all the different things that you may be doing but I feel you are in danger. And so I'm going to open up my mouth and I'm going to give you a warning. And now you can choose to heed to it or not. I find it really interesting because Jesus says something to Peter. When he starts to look at the wind and the waves that are now surrounding him, and he begins to slip and he's falling, he cries out, Jesus, save me. And that's when the Bible says Jesus reaches down, grabs him, picks him up. But Jesus says something to him. Oh, you of what? He says, oh, you of what? He says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, this kind of took me by surprise because I read this as I was kind of studying. And I was like, all right, Jesus, this is not making sense. So you talk about Peter having little faith, but... You also talked about before, if you would have only the faith of a mustard seed, you could go and look at the mountain and say, be removed and thrown into the sea. And so I said, okay, Jesus, there has to be a difference between little faith and small faith. Multiple times talked about little faith. Little faith means you have a lack of trust. It's actually doubt. I am now taking my eye off of everything that I thought that I had agreement with or trust in. I have little faith. But small faith has an understanding that it may be small right now, but the possibilities of what it can consist of, that's what makes this faith Amazing. The difference you have between a chihuahua puppy and a pit bull puppy, they're both little for a moment. Because that chihuahua, when it's fully grown, is still little. But that pit bull puppy, when it gets big, it's different size. The difference between little faith and small faith. 
the Bible then says that the disciples' hearts, they didn't quite understand the last miracle they just witnessed as far as the fishes and the loaves. The Bible says their hearts were hardened, meaning they didn't have an understanding of what Jesus had just done. And now they were even more confused because they're seeing Jesus walk on the water, seeing Peter walk on the water, but they know that he is something amazing. They're worshiping him, but they don't have a revelation quite of who he is. I'm here to tell you, if we are going to truly do what Jesus has done, first off, we need to do what Jesus has done in private before we do what Jesus has done in public. That's the first thing. The Bible says that he went to a place by himself private to pray. Then he walked on the water. So I'm looking at the order here. He went to a place private to pray. And then he was able to walk on the water. I'm going to say it one more time. He went to a place in private to pray. That's why that vocabulary of prayer is so important. Because if you find yourself in a place where I want to be used in public, like you, Jesus, and I feel like he is imploring his people, do what I have done in private. And then you can worry about doing what I do in public. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Next, if we are going to truly understand what Jesus is in our lives, we have to have a revelation of who he is in our lives. The God you see is the God you get. It's just that simple. Because some people, they saw Jesus as only a carpenter. They were able to get their house fixed. But others, they saw Jesus as a savior. And those were the people who were able to get their life fixed. Having a revelation of who he is, that's when you are able to operate. Because Peter had that revelation. He says, if it's you, you are him. You are him, Jesus. You are him. If it's you, bid me come. And he was able to operate. Promised land, do you know who you are? I, I want to ask you again. Do you truly know who you are? Do you truly know the legacy that you are upholding? Do you know the trail that has been blazed? And if you truly do, more importantly, do you know whose you are? Because when you have a revelation of being his prized possession, the apple of his eye, that causes you to walk a little bit differently. That causes you to have a little bit different posture. Because you know that you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are more than a conqueror. You have that revelation of who you are, remembering it's the same water, but different faith. I am now taking back to a part of the story that doesn't really seem connected at all. But when I think about the water being the same water, but a different level of faith being attached to that water, my mind automatically goes to a different story in Scripture. We look at the book of John, chapter 2. Jesus finds himself invited to a wedding. And at this wedding, he's just a guest. And he wasn't necessarily on assignment. But we know the story, right? The wedding is going on, and the people have found they have gone through all of the refreshments. And they're in a panic at this point. And Mary, she says, Jesus, they got a problem. Mary not only knew who she was, but she also knew whose 
she was. I'm your mama, and I'm going to go find my son who I know can fix the problem that the people are experiencing. And Jesus, we know the story, says, what does that have to do with me? It's, it's not my problem. Did that stop Mary? No. Again, she knew who she was. When you know who you are, when you face a little bit of opposition, you see that as not just an obstacle. You see it as an opportunity, right? And so Mary, at that point, she doesn't even talk back to Jesus. She turns to somebody else underneath that authority and says, whatever he says do, you do it. And walks away. Same water, different faith. So now Jesus, he has found himself in a position where I have to respond to that level of faith. This level of understanding who I am, it is pulling something out of me even before I thought I was ready for it. Or maybe he was already ready. Maybe he came to the wedding knowing exactly what he was going to need to do, but he was just waiting for somebody to have a level of faith to pull it out of him, saying, Jesus, I know what you can do. I'm not even going to argue with anybody about your ability. Right now, I am talking to your response ability. Your response right now is going to determine what's going to take place next. So you, underneath this authority, whatever he says do, you do it. And I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to let it just happen. The Bible says they filled up six water pots that were made of stone. Now, these water pots, they were there for the purification process. You're at a wedding. Everybody's now coming. They have to wash their hands and their feet. They had an intended purpose, right? They were made out of an uncut piece of stone because they need to be pure. So they have a specific purpose at this wedding. Y'all following me? So you have these water pots. Now there's one, two, three, four, five. There's six water pots. Man was created on the one, two, three, four, five. The sixth day. Okay, so we see a correlation between six, number of man. Okay, we have six water pots here. They're made of stone. Now the way that my mind goes to the stone has to signify something in particular, right? Now I'm fast forwarding or rewinding, mind you, back all the way to the book of Exodus. Now, everything inside scripture, understand Jesus, he paints these word pictures. And everything he's painting is pointing back to something that took place a long ago. And really, what took place long ago was really pointing to something that was gonna happen in the future. It's kind of a linear line to understand. And when you start to kind of read scripture from that lens, things start to illuminate into your mind because nothing that is written down in these 66 books was written there just because. It was there for a specific reason. So we understand what the stones represent, right? Now we have Moses. He is going before the people. He's up on the mountain all by himself, and God is literally writing his law on these stone tablets. The Ten Commandments. One through ten. Moses takes the God-breathed, God-written law for his people down to the camp. And we know the story. They are wilding out. Completely going against everything Yahweh would stand for. Moses, in his anger, throws the tablets down, which signifies the broken covenant of the law Automatic before the law was even given, it was broken. <laughs> That's good all by itself. And so he sees them wilding out. He tells them, Bring the idol over to me. We're gonna melt it down, we're gonna put it inside the water, and you are going to drink it as a remembrance of what you have done here today. Now, I think about another story. This happened in the book of Exodus. 22, 
we rewind to Exodus chapter, I'm sorry, that was Exodus 32. We rewind back to Exodus number 17. The people are complaining yet again. And they're saying we should have just died in the wilderness if you're not going to give us water to drink. And so what does Moses do? He goes before God and says, God, your people, they're thirsty. Their animals are going to die. What are we going to do? And so the king of all kings, the ancient of days, the rock of ages says, I want you to go to this rock. And I want you to take your staff, that same staff that you lifted up above your head and you were able to part the Red Sea, that same staff where you were able to tap the Nile and blood were to appear. Take that staff and I want you to strike the rock. And out of the rock is going to pour water. This water is what you were going to give the people to drink. This is the same water they had to pour the idol that they just destroyed because it's the same water but different faith. See, it can work in reverse too. You find yourself in a place where I don't really believe you, God, that you're going to give me what I need. Moses, you've been gone on top of the mountain too long, so I'm going to make this image, this idol to go before me. And Moses says, no, no, no. I'm going to have a picture reminder of exactly why that was the wrong move. Later on, in Numbers, the people are yet again complaining, saying, we need water to drink. And so Moses and Aaron, they go before God and they say, what are we going to do? And God says, I want you to go before the assembly, but I want you to speak to the rock. And when you speak to the rock, water is going to flow. Now Moses, who had an anger problem, an anger problem that was never addressed, it was only buried real deep. And sometimes we think that we have a level of anointing that's going to destroy everything, but you need to still operate with a level of deliverance too. So he's dealing with his anger issue. And he says, you rebels, must I do everything for you? He's putting himself in a position that he was never supposed to be in. And he takes that same staff and he strikes the rock once and nothing happens. And he strikes the rock a second time and now water's starting to flow. Disobeying the explicit instructions of God Almighty. Now, the beautiful part of this story is that God, even though Moses disobeyed, still used Moses to bring the water out. Even in the midst of his disobedience, he didn't completely embarrass Moses. That's good all by itself. He says, but you are also, since you disobeyed, will not lead my people into the promised land. Because in the book of Corinthians, Paul says, when the people were in the wilderness and they experienced this and that, he says, you also wanted to have water come out of the rock. And I told you to beat the rock. And that rock was called Christ. So in the book of Exodus, that rock was signifying Christ. And he told Moses to beat the rock to establish the picture he was painting of Jesus being beaten and crucified. He says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Jesus, at the end of Passover, stood up and said, if any man thirst." If any man believe in me, let him only ask, and I will give him living water. He's painting the picture, sending us all the way back to Exodus about the living water that was going to come up out of the rock of Jesus. Now we fast forward to Numbers. Moses is messing up the picture because he's beating the rock again. 
But once my Savior was crucified, he says, I'm not going to get back on that cross for your salvation ever again. And so I have to now paint a different picture with Moses. You, representing the law, will not be able to take the people to the promised land. So I'm going to take the second person, which was Joshua. Joshua, Yeshua, G Joshua, Yeshua, Joshua, Yeshua, Yeshua pulls out of Joshua, which is the name of Jesus. He says, I'm going to take Joshua, and he is going to lead you into the promised land the same way that Jesus says, I am going to lead my people to the promised land because the stone tablets, the work that you've been working at, you don't have the capacity to do it. It's my law. My law is good. The law is not the problem. We're the problem. I said the law is not the problem. We are the problem. But Jesus says, in my kindness, I am not going to destroy the law. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, he says, I've come to fulfill the law. Not the end of it, but I am going to fulfill the law. You're not going to put me on the cross again. But notice he says, in order for you to fulfill the law, an action needed to take place. He says, I want you to speak to the rock. He says, I'm painting this picture because now what comes out of your mouth. That is what's going to now get you into the promised land. What comes out of your mouth, promised land, matters. The book of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he says in chapter 31, I'm, I'm almost done. He says this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, Moses. My covenant which they break, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be, I will be their God and they will be my, I need you to say it with your chest, I will be their and they will be, come on, next verse. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember. That's good all by itself. And that's a good place to put a praise on that. He says, I will write the law on their hearts and their minds. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. But then you have the prophet Ezekiel said, hey, hey, Jeremiah, tag me in. Tag me in, Jeremiah. I got something I want to say too. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse number 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of, I will take the heart of, out of your flesh and give you a heart of, I will take your heart of stone. There goes that stone again. 
the stone from the tablets, the stone from the rock, your heart of stone. Jesus says, I'm going to rewrite onto your heart a heart of flesh. Because what's next is the living water that's going to flow up out of you. And that's my spirit. Because that is the only thing that's going to give you the ability to be able to follow after this law, the standard that I'm meeting. We are fast forwarding right back to that wedding at Cana. Mary says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. He says, I want you to go fill these water pots. Fill them up. They grab the water pots. They turn around, and they're grabbing these pots who were made out of And they take these pots, and they submerge them in the water. And they pull them out the water. And the water's up to the brim. It's the same water. And now he says, I want you to dip out of that water pot and serve it to the master of ceremonies. And I don't know when the water, the same water, the same water transitioned into something that was totally brand new turn the properties of it completely changed. Does that sound kind of familiar with the water that could be inside of us, how he takes us and he changes us into something brand new? I saw this as a perfect picture in the book of Acts Chapter 2, verse number 38, um, Peter, I think it was Peter, it's Peter, he says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent means to turn. Whatever he says do, you do it. Turn. Okay. Okay. So I turn. He says, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. I'm taking the water pots and I'm dipping them inside the water. And I'm doing it underneath the authority of who? The authority of Jesus who is telling me to do this. I'm dipping the water pots in the water, and now I bring them up out of the water, and that's when the transition happens. He says, I will fill you with the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm done, promised land. I dare you to stand on your feet right now. If you understand that you serve a God who wants to take your stony heart, this heart that is so rock solid and set on everything that I would like to do. He says, I want to turn it into a heart of flesh. We are underneath an apostolic authority in this house. And we are not going to just huck and buck and shout. That's all I have this wonderful place. But if you leave out of here and you have forgotten who I am, you've lost nothing. But if you leave out of here, promised land, and you climb into your vehicle and you don't know the matchless name of Jesus who died for you, who was the picture of our salvation, who wants to fill you with his spirit, so that way you are able to operate at a higher level, to walk on the things that other people are drowning in. If you want that spirit, it's available today. It's available here today. 
If you have not been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's a free gift. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to plead for it. You don't have to pay any money for it. It's here for free. If you only repent of your sins, that means to turn away. I can't repent for you. The pastor can't repent for you. Bishop can't repent. No one can repent for you. That's something that you have to do all alone. But if you, to purpose inside your heart, God, I've hurt you. God, I've sinned. I've been selfish. I've been hurtful. I've done things that I'm ashamed of. Lord God, I don't want to be like Moses and strike the rock when you've told me to speak. You've told me to speak, and right now I don't want to operate from a level of disobedience anymore. So I ask God that you forgive me for every evil thought, evil action, evil deed, Anything and everything that's unlike you, I ask you to forgive me for. I repent, I turn away. Never to return. And if you ask him to do that, he will fill you with his precious gift of speaking with new tongues. Notice what comes out of Moses' mouth was what was going to produce that living water. The sound that comes out of your mouth that's what's going to bring you to the promised land. So as we bring our hands to a place of surrender, I want to give us an opportunity and a moment for you to repent, for you to ask God. Maybe you just need a refilling of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you just need another touch. Whatever you have need of for right now, you have an opportunity to leave here transformed and changed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We are your people, your prized possession, God. And we stand before you, Lord God, with repentant hearts, with repentant minds. We ask, God, that you fill us yet again with something that is brand new, something that is potent, Something, Lord God, that is life-changing. Fill our hearts and our minds, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I said before I spoke, there's someone out there who needs to give God another yes, and I feel that yet again in my spirit so I don't know who it is but someone needs to give God another yes give God another yes there is something that he wants to do for you in you through you this morning so as the praise team lead us in worship find a dedicated place that you can make yourself an altar and invite the king of all kings to tabernacle in that place right now, whether it's at your seat, by yourself, whether it's up here at the altar, it doesn't matter. Find a consecrated place for you and God to talk. Hallelujah.